What's up rail fans? Today we find ourselves in Anole Yard in 2016 looking at what is literally got to be the world's smallest locomotive. Seriously, look at that thing. But before we get into that, As long as you have industries and non-railroad civil engineers designing hopelessly sharp curved industry tracks and sidings, there will be some call for the diesel mice and in-cab short wheelbase switch engines. Santa Fe's last in-cab switcher, excluding the beep, was said to switch refinery with stupid sharp curves in a plant at Augusta, Kansas. Railroad design standards have demanded lighter curves for over a generation. The newer locomotives with the incredibly restrictive coupler throws started appearing in the 1990s and generally are all there is on a class 1 railroad these days. None of these newer locomotives can turn or couple in a curve because they're designed that way. Newer locomotives, especially passenger locomotives, are scary things in yard track curves. The wheel sets are much more prone to climbing over the rails or rolling over the rail with excessive lateral force. There are multiple places where railroads set out cars for industries to come get with their diesel mice because the road locomotives are no longer able to negotiate those curves. Yard and local units spend most of their time in rail yards and on local trains to spot cars at industries and average fewer miles per loco than a road locomotive. They will usually have a lower horsepower rating, lighter weight, and can be either four or six axles. The majority of road and local engines are hand-me-downs from road service and because parts are still plentiful for them, they are still very reliable. No true switcher or reliable low horsepower locomotives are built today as the last designated switcher was built in 1984 and the last four axle diesel was built in 1991. This creates a dilemma for a class 1 railroad since no longer can older road locomotives be retired to yard and local service. Today's heavy-duty road locomotives are too long and heavy for local service, and the gen-set locomotives from all of the builders have not lived up to performance and reliability expectations. NS tried four- and six-axle gen-sets from both major manufacturers, but they proved to be too light, which severely limited their wet rail pulling ability. We talked about the dynamics of railroad switching in video T125. A switch engine is pretty much a one-trick pony, while a road unit can be used for both switching and on the road, making it a better choice in terms of equipment, especially for those on a limited budget. And now that we're seeing more genset and hybrid locomotives, I suspect we might see a return to more one-trick ponies. In 1939, the Electromotive Corporation launched one of its most successful diesels, the SW1. Along with the NW2, it was intended for all types of switching work as the new locos were much improved versions of the earlier SC and SW models and were equipped with the new 6-cylinder 567A prime mover, with the SW1 being rated at 600 horsepower while the NW2 was rated at 1000 horsepower. From the late 1930s to the present day, the SW1 has a proven track record as one of the most successful switchers ever built. Their small size makes them ideal for all types of heavy industries that require a reliable in-plant loco to keep the rail cars moving. Production was halted during World War II, but resumed quickly in 1946 at EMD's Cleveland, Ohio plant. With minor modifications, over 600 were built through 1953, with some still going strong on short lines and museums after decades of service. The SW1 was the second generation of 600 horsepower switchers from EMD. The use of EMD's own engine design, the 567, was the most significant change from the SW and SC models that came before them. The SW1s were built between December 1942 and November 1953. Final assembly was at EMD's plant at LaGrange, Illinois, and despite a war production board suspension and diesel production from 1942 and 1945, EMD managed to produce over 600 SW1s. And while it did not sell as well as the NW2, the SW1 and its successors became EMD's primary switcher line. 
Today, examples can still be found in all types of applications from regular freight service to industrial settings. You can also find them hosting excursions and tourist trains, and even one of the first SW1s built, the Southern Pacific No. 1000, is preserved at the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento. Or at least it was. While Electromotor produced a wide range of highly successful switchers such as the NW2, SW1200, SW1500, and SW9, the series can be traced back to a group of early 6 and 900 horsepower variants that were built during the latter 1930s. This included the SC, the SW, the NC, and the NW that were manufactured with either cast or welded frames. For example, SC referred to 600 horsepower cast frame while SW denoted 600 horsepower welded frame. These switches were built during an era that predated the modern road diesels and some railroads still preferred locomotives with cast frames, hearkening back to the steam era. As the years passed, EMD's method of identifying models seemingly changed every few years. In some cases, the number simply denoted its number in the series while later the horsepower rating was included. We talked about this briefly in my GP30 video just a few episodes back. In addition, the NW2 was the last in the short-lived NW line. Following its production run, Electromotive dropped the first letter in identifying the horsepower rating. It also eliminated the cast or welded designation as the latter became the preferred production method. In their place, the builder retained the SW lettering, which now meant simply switcher. The SW1 featured a 600 horsepower prime mover and retained Electromotive's signature short car body of just 44 feet with tapering near the cab for improved visibility. The SW1's most recognizable feature is the large sandbox just under the grill. Its location is unique to this particular model. After World War II, the SW1 was equipped with EMD's updated 567A prime mover, which still produced 600 horsepower. During this time, the model also featured a slight update to its car body. The original was designed with a double taper near the cab, while the updated version included a single taper. Other new additions included a lower exhaust stack which became standard on all future EMD switcher locomotives for better crew visibility, rectangular instead of curved windshields above the hood that began in the 1950s, mid-1950s to be specific, and twin sealed beam red lights. The SW1 enjoyed a long production run and due to their flexibility, reliability and cheap price, numerous Class 1s and short lines purchased the model over its 13 year production span. It also found great interest in the private sector where companies like Wheeling Steel, Warner Sand and Gravel, Republic Steel, Cleveland Quarries and even the U.S. Army purchased the model. The SW1 was complemented by the SW7 in 1949 and the SW8 in 1950 and with its replacement the equally powerful SW600 that started production in February 1954. It's no secret that end cab switchers are in their twilight because locomotive manufacturers just don't make them anymore. I almost hate that I grew up and matured with the charming Pocono Northeast 601, 901 and 77 in the 1980s. End cab switchers, or buttheads as some railroad folk called them, had personality then and they still do today. So here's to you, the buttheads of the railroad industry. Toiling away in the yards and on industrial spurs of Class 1 railroads are a small but important group of locomotives built several generations ago, the end cab switchers. Once seen in almost every major yard and working back alleys spotting freight cars at customers' docks, their importance on a railroad's roster, unfortunately, has diminished over the years. Electromotive Division of General Motors, or what we know as EMD, had by far the most successful line of in-cab switchers. The company built more than two dozen variants during a production period that spanned more than half a century. While all major builders constructed their own style of in-cab and offset cab and center cab and critters and all kinds of other types of switchers, Hundreds of which still live on in short line and industrial roles today. Only EMD models survive today 
on all seven Class 1 railroads, except maybe for CP. As the need for purpose-built switch engines waned in the 1960s and 1970s, the railroads began to look for a more versatile locomotive that could perform both road and yard chores. Responding to that need, EMD constructed a variation to its successful 1500 horsepower SW1500 switcher introduced in the 1960s called the SW1504. The SW1504 was essentially an SW1500 equipped with a higher speed Blomberg road switcher truck, but its design failed to attract the attention of U.S. railroads. Only one customer, the Nationales de Mexico, bought it. The final line of road switchers EMD introduced in the early 1970s was the multi-purpose or MP line of switchers. This model used Blomberg trucks and had options for accessories such as a toilet to meet crew requirements for service outside of yards. Sales of the MP line were modest in the 1970s and 1980s with MP15DC, MP15AC, and MP15T productive collectively failing to match the totals of other well-known EMD models such as the SW9, the SW1200, and the SW1500. The main difference between the three MP models is that the MP15DC uses a DC main generator while the MP15AC has an AR10 alternator. The MP15T uses an 8-cylinder turbocharged engine instead of a 12-cylinder engine used in the AC and DC models. Deregulation of America's railroads under the Staggers Act in 1980, however, nixed the switcher manufacturing business. Under Staggers, freight railroads were now permitted to radically overhaul their networks, operating procedures, and business models since they were now free of ICC supervision. One of the resulting changes was downsizing of unprofitable operations with many other branch lines and local operations either abandoned or sold off to lower operating cost short lines. We saw a lot of that here in northeastern Pennsylvania with Conrail. That created a surplus of low horsepower locomotives and GM's EMD subsidiary assembled its last MP15 ACs for freight railroads in October 1980. Four for the Katy and one for the Golden Triangle short line out of Mississippi. Several MP15 ACs were delivered to U.S. government facilities and Canadian port operators in 1982 through August 1984 when National Harbor Board No. 8406 was shipped from the London, Ontario plant to the Montreal port operator. The final 34 MP15 Ts were delivered to the seaboard system in late 1984 and 1985. The last models produced by EMD continued to survive in sizable numbers on Class 1 railroads with the SW1500, the MP15DC, the MP15AC, and MP15T models that are most prevalent. Other than the standard maintenance cycles, most fleets are still in their as-built configurations. Recently, several railroads have attempted to implement upgrades to their end cab switchers in an effort to extend their service life, but one eliminated them entirely. Canadian Pacific is the only railroad to completely purge its end cab switcher fleet from revenue service. The last MP15 ACs were eliminated from their roster in late 2014, leaving only SW900 number 6711. This unit was captive at CP's Ogden Locomotive Shops in Calgary and was used as a shop switcher and for positive train control testing. That was back in 2014. The Canadian National had embarked on a small overhaul program at its Homewood, Illinois shops on its remaining SW14 switchers. The SW14s were originally built for the Illinois Central in the 1950s as EMD SW7s and SW9s. Illinois Central's Paducah, Kentucky shop remanufactured them in the 1980s and designated them as SW14s. Canadian National still owned four in 2014 and was rebuilding them for service in the Chicago area. Union Pacific was underway with the program to upgrade their fleet of MP15 ACs and MP15 DCs, installing ZTR's Nexus 3 eye control systems at its North Little Rock, Arkansas shops. Try saying that fast three times. The control system was popular with UP, which was installing this and other locomotive models as well. The Norfolk Southern was the most ambitious in terms of rebuilding its NCAP switcher fleet. 
The Rosedale Tuna, Pennsylvania and Roanoke, Virginia shops began a rebuild program on the MP-15 DC fleet in 2011 that involved replacing the main generator with an AR-10 alternator, adding alignment control couplers and other upgrades. NS also upgraded one MP-15 DC in 2011 with increased horsepower output. Number 2423 had its stock 1500 horsepower 12 cylinder 645E prime mover replaced with a turbocharged version of the same engine rated at 2500 horsepower but was later reduced to 2100 horsepower. The radiator system was enlarged to support the increased cooling needed by the higher horsepower engine including an enlarged long hood with additional radiators and cooling fans. The unit now designated as an MP21E also received the other upgrades found on other MP15E rebuilds. With their ranks slowly diminishing by the decade, in-cab switchers will most likely always have a role on certain Class 1 rosters due to their smaller size and weight, but their days dominating yard and industrial service certainly peaked a long time ago, at least with the Class 1s. It's no secret that railroading in the 21st century is different than it was in the 20th century, hence the title of this channel. But railroading has always been railroading, and there are certain things that really don't change much over the years. Take switching, for example. Now, from a rail fan perspective, at least from my perspective, I love to see switching action. It tends to be a little bit slow, rudimentary, but it's just interesting to watch. From a railroad perspective, switching is kind of like railroad diamonds. <laughs> it's not a railroad's best friend. Switching, admittingly, from a railroad perspective, is slow, it's laborious, it's time consuming and it's tedious. You know, we don't think a lot of the things that we don't think about as rail fans are the technical aspects of railroading. When you talk about railroad switching, it's kind of akin to rush hour traffic, a lot of start stops. Uh, in the case of switching, you, you're constantly slamming up against cars. Things like that take its toll on a locomotive. A lot of rail fans don't realize that, but that takes its toll on an engine, on the couplers, on the frame, you name it all those parts. So switchers have to be designed durable. Switching locomotives themselves, they've been around a long time. They go back to the 1930s. In fact, they might even go back to the 1920s. In today's railroad environment, as the big railroads try to do as less switching as possible, a lot of that duty has fallen back on smaller railroads like the short lines, some regionals, and even the individual companies themselves, and in some cases, switching contractors. And that brings us to this little doohickey here. The Tractive Power Corporation's TP56. The TP obviously standing for Tractive Power. It's a very simple but high-tech locomotive and pretty much what you see in this picture is what you get. It's built from an SD40-2 frame. In this case, it's the Canadian Pacific 5805. Now, I looked in my archives. I did not have a picture of the 5805, but I do have a picture of the 5905, so hopefully that'll be good enough. Now, here's what you have to understand about Canadian Pacific. Unlike any other railroad that I know of, Canadian Pacific's SD40-2s, they, they tended to really range in terms of the little stuff. In other words, you could almost say, and I say almost, so for all you nitpickers, take your hand off the keyboard, you could almost say that no two CP SD40-2s were exactly alike. I mean, they all had their little their little subtle differences to them. But nonetheless, this is made from the 59, uh, I'm sorry, the 5805. It has air conditioning, it has good visibility, it has a stainless steel ceiling, and it's pretty rugged. And you know, it's something that's typical of switching. Another thing that's typical of switching is when you're dealing with switching in yards, you're dealing with lots of switches some rough spots and especially in wet weather you're dealing with slippery spots so any switch engine has to have good tractive effort and this one has that it has 375 horsepower and it puts out a whopping wow 70,000 pounds of tractive effort best of all they're very environmentally friendly they're tier 4 and tier 3 compliant here in North America Conrail locomotive number zero is a true oddity of the railroad industry First of all, just the fact that it's still in Conrail paint. In fact, this could be very well the last operating locomotive on Norfolk Southern in Conrail paint. But this little doohickey or gizmo, if you will, it's an electric shop switcher. It's a single power truck that's powered by electricity and it's supplied by the, the electricity is supplied by a tether, if I'm if I'm correct. If there's anybody out there who knows differently, obviously put it in the comments. 
It's battery powered and radio controlled and has basically spent its life at Enola moving locomotives in and out of the Wheel True building. I'll tell you, it's something to see that little thingamajig moving big monsters around like the 1703 that it's about to couple onto and take into the shop. But what's interesting about this picture is all three locomotives have an interesting story behind them. That 1703, that's an ex Erie Lackawanna SD45 2. Now, I did a video about the SD45 2 a few months back, but actually, it was back in 2018. I'll throw a link to that video in the description. The SD45 2 is one of only six on Norfolk Southern. Not only one of six SD45 2s, but I do believe one of six remaining Erie Lackawanna units on Norfolk Southern. I could be wrong about that. If I am, put it in the comments. It's also one of the handful of pre-Conrail predecessor road locomotives on NS. But without getting too deep into it and giving away too much, there are still some Erie Lackawanna, Penn Central, Lehigh Valley, and Reading locomotives that are still on Norfolk Southern serving. Obviously not in their paint, but they're, they are on Norfolk Southern. In fact, one of them in this video. Another oddball locomotive on NS is that 101 sitting there. It's one of only two on the railroad. These are four axle three engine genset locomotives. The two units were assembled in Juniata in 2007 from kits supplied by Rail Power Technologies using the frames of former Norfolk Southern, nay Southern, GP38 AC diesels. They're classified as RP20BDs. In this image here, we have an interesting look at today's Norfolk Southern Power. The obvious subject of interest is that 100 smack dead in the center of the screen, the sister to the 101. Coupled to it is 2101, an ex Reading Railroad switcher, still holding it down for the Norfolk Southern. In the background there, you have two ex Conrail locomotives, an SD60I and a Dash 840CW. In the background there, that's the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania skyline. 1940 built Alco HH660, the DLW number 409, returned to its home rails in Scranton on Wednesday, August 12, 2020. The Genesee Valley Transportation Company bought the rare high hood Alco to restore and preserve at its DL base here in Scranton. The 409 was transported on the flat car instead of being towed in because the truck under the cab has friction bearings. This truck carries a patent from Canada that dates back to 1925. The paint on the front number board on the engineer side of the engine is peeling off to reveal its Erie Lackawanna number 324. The DL's Taylor Interchange train BR1 slash DL3 retrieved the 409 from Taylor Yard, which you may remember is a former Delaware Lackawanna and Western property itself. It was brought back to Steamtown and run over the Diamond Branch and the Strawberry Hill connecting track to the ex dnh main line where the Alco Doc himself, Don Colangelo, brought it back to the Breck Street shops where a rigging company unloaded the local from the flat car. It's now at the new Von Storch Diesel shop in North Scranton.
The 660 horsepower Electromotive Corporation SW1 in cap switcher number 1901, that was a mouthful, has an incredible life story. It was built in an astonishingly 1939, the same year that the FT Streamline diesel freight unit was introduced by EMC. The FT diesel is the engine that single high handedly wiped out the steam locomotive. The 1901 was first tested on the Atlantic coastline and was soon rejected and returned to EMC after being found inadequate for the duties for which it was to be assigned. Worthy of mention is that the ACL had also tested an ALCO HH660 which it ironically numbered number 1900. 1901 was then resold to the Richmond Terminal Railroad and placed into service on March 15, 1940 as the Richmond Terminal Railway engine number 1. During the early years of World War II, it was found that the engine wasn't heavy enough for the increased passenger work at the Broad Street Station, so it was transferred to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, all while substituting it at the Broad Street Station with one of the 1,000 horsepower Alco diesel switchers which the RFMP then had on order. On April 1, 1944, the little EMD was purchased outright by the RFMP and was renumbered RFMP number 50. The engine was used at Bolton Yard in the vicinity of the Richmond Freight Station until it was sold yet again and shipped to the Canton Railway Company in Baltimore on March 30, 1956 as locomotive number 26. Coincidentally, the Canton Railroad was the original owner of five other SW1 diesels numbered 21 through 25. Over the years and through several more owners, it slowly worked its way up the East Coast, toiling for such companies as the New Jersey Contracting Corporation, also as number 26, and the McCormick Sand and Gravel Company in South Amboy, New Jersey, again as number 26. It finally made its way into the Keystone State and the Tawanda Monroton Shippers Lifeline, a tiny short line operation in Tawanda in February 1977, again as number 26. While there, it was painted into a Lehigh Valley inspired color scheme, the one that you see here. In December of 2009, the railroad and the locomotive were both bought by the Reading and Northern and the number 26 somehow ended up at Steamtown in late 2014. I say somehow because it was always my impression that the Reading and Northern's owner, Andy Muller, had a beef with the Pennsylvania Northeastern Regional Rail Authority, similar to the one he currently has with the North Shore system of central Pennsylvania. After being stored for the last few years, the 1901, formerly Lehigh Valley number 26, looks like it's coming back to life and being put back into operation.
Western Maryland Railway Baldwin VO 1000 diesel switcher number 132, which was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1944, later worked for the Eastman Chemical Company in Kingsport, Tennessee as number 5. It was displayed at the North Carolina Transportation Museum as Seaboard Airline number 1415, but was transferred to the Hagerstown Roundhouse Museum in Hagerstown, Maryland, and has been restored to its original Western Maryland 132 identity. Lima was a latecomer to diesel technology and stayed by steam locomotives in the production throughout the 1940s. Nickel Plate Road's famous 284 Berkshire class came late in the steam era. The company didn't move to diesel technology until 1950. At the time, it merged with Baldwin. Baldwin had been a steam locomotive maker and at one time the biggest producer in the United States, but did go down the path of diesel sooner than Lima did. Prior to its combination with Baldwin, Lima merged in 1947 with Hamilton and formed Lima Hamilton. At first glance, you might spot these Lima diesel switchers as Alco made S-series models. The similarities are great, and while you can say Alco's FA units and Electromotive's F units share some traits, the look of Lima switcher, the first one was offered with 750 horsepower by the way, is a near dead ringer for Alco's S-series. The series went on to include 1,000 horsepower and 1,200 horsepower models, and according to Jeff Wilson's Train's Guide to North American Diesel Locomotives, which was published in 2017 by Kalmbach, the units are LH750, LH1000, and LH1200 models. And though there are some variations, essentially the platform was consistent across the series. Though by the time the switches presented here came, the company was Baldwin, Lima, Hamilton. Cincinnati Union Terminal was the exclusive owner of Lima's half dozen LS 750s which were numbered 20 through 25. Built in late 1945 and the first of this series. An 800 horsepower version followed Lima's LS 800 with Rock Island buying a pair which were numbered 800 and 801 and the New York Central subsidiary the Chicago River and Indiana Railroad owning 21 9800 through 9820. In Lima's catalog, the LS750 was the company's A-3149 model and the LS800 was the A-3171. Are you confused yet? With six railroads and Armco Steel buying them, Lima's LS1000 expanded the scope of use for the diesel builder's product. The locomotive was powered by a Hamilton T-89-SA 8-cylinder prime mover. 
of the 38 that were produced, Baltimore and Ohio, numbers 330 through 339, and Erie Railroads, number 650 through 659, each bought 10 of those examples. New York Central six units, 8400 through 8405, was the next largest fleet, followed by the nickel plate roads four LS-1000s that were numbered 305 through 308. TPNW's trio, that's Toledo, Peoria, and Westerns, 300 through 302, included Lima's demonstrator number 1000 that was renumbered to TPNW number 300. Armco Steel bought three units, which were numbered 707 through 709, and also picked up a Lima demonstrator number 1000, which became Armco number 707. Finally, Wabash's pair, 400 and 407, were also former Lima demonstrators 1001 and 1003. Lima's LS-1200 included the same Hamilton Prime mover as found in the LS-1000. With an adjustment to settings, the four-axle diesel switcher produced 1,200 horsepower. This was the largest seller for this LS series of NCAB diesel switchers with 69 examples going to seven railroads and Armco Steel buying three units, 710, E109, and E110. Railroads that bought the Lima's LS-1000 and also LS-1200s included the Baltimore and Ohio, who had numbers 320 through 329 and numbers 340 through 353, making up two dozen roster members. The New Haven had numbers 630 through 639, and the Wabash had numbers 401 through 406 and 408 through 411. Each bought 10 LS-1200s. The Chicago River and Indiana Railroad had numbers 8406 through 8411. The Erie Railroad had 660 through 665. And the Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis had numbers 1200 through 1205. Each owned six units of this variety and the nickel plate bought four which were numbered 309 through 312. Two LS-1200s are listed as preserved with Armco E-110 at the Illinois Railway Museum, while the B&O 320 resides at the Whitewater Valley Railroad. <laughs>